Good morning. This is a recording for October the 15th coming up, our congregational meeting. And uh, other than that, a usual Sunday of good worship and singing to God. During the service, we're going to sing, Listen to My Cry, Lord, which comes from Psalm 116. And we will sing, My, uh, My Soul, Praise the Lord. Also a beautiful uh, psalm, taken from a beautiful psalm. Then, Alleluia, sing to Jesus and rejoice the Lord is King. We sing four hymns every Sunday. And if you are not used to singing hymns or you miss them, because where you go now, uh, if you're going to church now, wherever you go, they just don't sing the hymns. They sing songs that you don't know and you don't know the melody, but the band seems to know them. But I hope you'd like to come and join your brothers and sisters and sing to the Lord in our church. We will read four scriptures, Exodus 32, 1 through 14, Isaiah 25, 1 to 9, Colossians 1, 13 to 23, and the text for today is Philippians 4, 1 through 9, and I'm going to read that to you now. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy, my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companions, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding and comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true and honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, set your mind on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. As we pray for God to give us illumination about these words, because the entrance of God's word gives light, and it converts the soul. That's what we're after. We must remember that at this very moment, thousands of people are being displaced and being murdered. Uh, uh, Hamas has broken into Israel and has been murdering hundreds and hundreds of people who just were just everyday people just trying to live. People at a party and people in their homes. And... Israel is retaliating. Many thousands will die before this is over. We know that this is not the work of the Holy Spirit. When men murder and rape and plunder and take joy in those things, that is not from God, no matter what they say about their God. So let's pray about this right now as we should. Father, all over the world, there are haters of God and haters of men who do not love the things you love. And even men who murder and kill in your name, we know that is not right. Father, we ask that you would destroy the wicked, that you will break the teeth of those who plunder the innocent, that those who love your name would be spared. And for the church in Palestine and for the church in Israel, that you will protect your people. Oh, Lord, grant them strength. Grant them the power to love when they are hated. And deliver them, Lord. We pray for the same in Ukraine, that the church in Russia and the church in Ukraine would stand out as those who love peace. Give every innocent man the power to defend himself and to protect his family and his children. Father, come quickly. 
and give us this mercy in the Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would come quickly this day. Claim your honor. Destroy the wicked in judgment, that all may see the righteousness of God, that every knee will bend and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear our simple prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In the text that I just read you from Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 9, three times the apostle uses the phrase, in the Lord. In those three phrases, we are given the secret to every Christian's happiness and to the unity of a church. How can every Christian be happy in spite of circumstances? How can a church be in union in spite of the great differences among members? Well, in those three verses, we have those first in those verses we have the secret to every Christian's happiness. And the first of those phrases is stand fast in the Lord. Paul says that as in response to what he said earlier in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He said, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Whatever troubles you are facing right now, and I'll guarantee you've got them, no human life is without troubles. Paul says, keep the faith, stand fast in the Lord, don't give up the faith. Now here's some reasons to stand fast, and the scriptures give us all these reasons. First of all, stand fast in your faith because you are promised a resurrection. This life will end, sometimes it ends by the cruelty of other people, sometimes disease, sometimes war. But stand fast in your faith because you are promised the resurrection. Why would you jeopardize your resurrection by giving up your trust in Jesus? Stand fast in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 15, 58 says, In light of the coming resurrection, when we shall be raised immortal and imperishable and incorruptible, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your work in the Lord is not in vain. In the Lord is a key phrase, is it not? Stand fast in the Lord because of the resurrection that is coming. And then there's a second reason to stand fast in the Lord. Not only because of your promised resurrection, but stand fast in your faith because of your relationship to Jesus. Christianity and salvation is not the matter of knowing a bunch of facts. It's not a matter of even believing that Jesus lived. It's about a relationship by faith and believing all the things that our Lord Jesus has said and what he has said through his apostles. It is trusting in Christ alone and in his work for us. So stand fast in your faith because of your relationship to Jesus. Hebrews 3, 12 and 4, through 14 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Did you catch that? We have come to share in Christ, not because we've walked the sawdust trail at a, an evangelistic meeting, not because we joined a church, not because we gave a lot of money to a church, or we did good deeds for the orphanage. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Stand fast in your faith because of your relationship to Jesus. 
Our relationship to Christ is not impersonal. It is to the person of the Lord Jesus, the one who lived, died, and rose again from the dead, who has a body like we have, but now transfigured forever. So stand fast in your faith because of your resurrection and because of your relationship with Jesus. And thirdly, stand fast in your faith because the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. There is a wonderful world waiting for us, the inheritance of the saints. It is laid up for us in heaven. Why would you lose your inheritance that Jesus laid up for you? Why would you set that aside? Why would you give that up? Whatever in this life seems appealing, it will perish, and you will too. Why would you give up your inheritance in heaven by giving up and not standing fast in your faith? Colossians 1, 11 and 12 says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's praying that you'll be strengthened <clears throat> for all endurance and patience with joy. Stand fast in your faith because the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. I have two sisters. When, my, when our father died, he left a small inheritance that was to be di divided three ways. Well, that's natural. We are his blood. Each of us has a part, but we have equal parts. We have inheritance. I had an inheritance with my sisters, and they had one with me. You have an inheritance laid up for you in heaven, and it is sharing in the inheritance of Jesus himself, not just with the other saints. There's a remarkable passage in Romans that says, uh, God has made us heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Can you imagine that? What does Christ own? Everything. He owns life. He owns all things that make for, for happiness and joy. He owns beauty and truth and goodness and purity and eternal life. It all it belongs to him. Jesus said, all things in heaven and earth have been given to me, all authority, all power. Whatever Jesus owns, you own. Stand fast in your faith because the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints together with you, the Lord Jesus. So then that is the first phrase, stand fast in the Lord, the first phrase of in the Lord which if a Christian will do, we will have peace with God. We will have a successful Christian life. And the second phrase is found in verse two. Not only stand fast in the Lord, but agree in the Lord. This is first spoken to these two women who were at odds. We don't know the source of their quarrel, Euodia and Syntyche. But it was bad enough, their quarrel was bad enough that Paul heard about it when he was in prison in Rome. He knows these two women very well. He says they've labored beside him in the spread of the gospel in the establishing of the church in Philippi, and they have suffered persecution along with him. He says their names are in the book of life. These women were powerful believers. But now they are a wound in the Philippian church. He wrote in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, before our passage, obviously. If, they be, if there be any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love and participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. When he wrote those words in chapter 2, prior to the words about tell them to live together in harmony, did he have them in mind, these two women, who were disturbing themselves and disturbing the church? Agree in the Lord, he says. Tell Euodia and Syntyche to get over themselves. Agree in the Lord. Stand fast in your faith in the Lord and agree in the Lord. There's always a deep spiritual grief that runs through any church when people within the fellowship quarrel. It is not uncommon, but it is very destructive. It is alarming how quickly the spirit of contention spreads. It's like legionnaires disease on a cruise ship. People take sides. People magnify the offense. The faults of others are rehearsed. Soon, Satan has his foot in the door of the church. The fellowship of forgiven sinners is diminished. The complaints of disgruntled people become more frequent. Sour attitudes prevail and the spirit of sacrificial service wanes. Pretty soon, people don't want to belong to a church like that where there's quarrels, where there seems to be bitterness and factions in the church. Paul spoke about this at length in 1 Corinthians, where there were many factions. And he says, you are damaging the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He has not called us to quarrel. He has called us to peace and to sacrificial love. And pretty soon in a church where you have people quarreling, the volunteer spirit is put to death. People go, I don't want to do that. Uh, no, I'm not going to get involved because then I'll have to confront X, Y, Z. I'll just go somewhere else. That's what kills the church. Bitterness, unforgiving spirit. The resulting problem is that instead of encouraging each other in faith, folks begin to falter. Hebrews 10 says, Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. That's not written for somebody else. That's written for you. It's not somebody else's job. It's not the deacons, the elders. It's not the preacher's job to stir you up to good works. You must join them in also thinking, how can you stir other people up to love and good works? For this is pleasing in the sight of God. But squabbling among members only stirs one another up to accusations and a lack of true forgiveness. I've been an ordained pastor over 50 years. I've been involved in the church since I was at least eight years old. And I'm 76 now. I have seen this. What I'm talking about is absolutely true. Unless you agree in the Lord, you will cause disharmony and a faction to grow. The Apostle Paul is concerned that these two dear women who have labored hard beside him to establish the church will destroy the very contributions they made to the Philippian church. It is a great displeasing of the Lord Jesus when forgiven sinners cannot live in true harmony in the church because of their bruised ego or their pride or someone didn't pay them proper notice to something they did well or because they are they were slighted by someone else. The key to recovery is in the words agree in the Lord. When we are in the Lord, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Paul writes, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. This is in chapter 2 of Philippians. Chapter 4 is the one where he's telling us to agree in the Lord. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. So, 
Stand fast in your faith in the Lord and agree in the Lord. And then in verse 4, there's the third phrase, and is it is rejoice in the Lord. Stand fast, agree, rejoice in the Lord. Now, why is that important? Because in Christ, in the Lord, we have peace with God and the promise of the resurrection from the dead. It's found nowhere else but in Christ. So rejoice in the Lord. So the question is, how well do you know Jesus? If you rejoice in the Lord, how well do you know the Lord? Rejoicing in him is impossible unless you know him. Unless you trust him with all you have and all you are. The great quest of human life is to know God and to know Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Jesus said that in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, to know you, Father, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. The sorrows and disappointments of this life put great pressure on all of us to not rejoice in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. Everything we do is transient. It is temporary. And unless we put our trust in the Lord and rejoice in the Lord, whatever you're happy about will not last. It cannot last. It's made to perish. So you can't rejoice in the Lord until you know the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. There was a movie some time ago that had a concept in it that I've heard ever since that time. That is the concept of having a bucket list. The story in the movie was there were several old people, old men, who knew they were going to die soon, and what did they want to accomplish before they died? It was their bucket list. So they traveled or they did other things, but the bucket list concept has hit our culture. I've never heard anyone say they had a bucket list that included knowing Jesus Christ and rejoicing in him. Have you? What is your bucket list? That ought to be number one. I want to know Christ, to know the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. That was Paul's bucket list. What is your bucket list? The, head, the number one. There are many things you can want to do and many things that are good. Nothing wrong with them. But does your bucket list include knowing Jesus Christ and rejoicing in him? Here are some of the characteristics that lead us to rejoice in Jesus. Just a few things about him. In Colossians 1.14, it says, In him you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's how to motivate you to want to know Jesus the forgiveness of your sins through his blood. Colossians 1.16 In him and through him and for him all things were created. All the world belongs to the Lord Jesus. He dispenses it as he wills. The providence of God uh, gives to each as he sees fit. Whatever continent, whatever race, religion, geography, Everything belongs to the Lord Jesus. That's, that's the one to whom you're praying. Then the scripture says in Colossians 1 17, in him all things hold together. Uh, scientists have long sought, and philosophers too, to understand the question of the one and the many. What is the unity of all the universe? There are many things, but they seem to hold together. How can that be? Because Jesus, in him, all things hold together. Then Colossians 1, 19 and 20. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's remarkable. If you know Jesus, you know the fullness of God. And through him, God reconciled all things to himself. You are reconciled to God. Making peace through the blood of the cross. 
To know Jesus is to know that fact and to be at peace. Colossians 1.22, In him you are reconciled to God by the body of his flesh in his death. Again, reconciled to God by the body of Jesus, which he gave willingly. He had no sin. Death had no hold on him. But when he took on your sins, he took on your death. And the wrath of God punished him. You are redeemed through the sacrifice of the body of Christ. And then the scripture says, In him we have a perfect high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for us. You cannot just saunter into the presence of God. You need an advocate. You need a high priest. We have a high priest. Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says he ever lives to pray for us, to make intercession for us. Isn't that good to know Christ himself? Isn't that worthy of your bucket list? In him we also have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. When you get discouraged, read the book of Revelation. Two reasons. One is the Bible says whoever reads it will be blessed. Just reading it. You don't have to understand. Just read but the second is, we see our magnificent King of Kings and Lord of Lords riding out in glory, conquering all the world and everything laid at his feet. To know him, to know him is to rejoice in the Lord. We sing a couple of great hymns. Here's one of them. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearest waters roll, while the tempest still is nigh. Hide me, O oh my Savior, hide, till the storms of life are past. Safe into the haven, guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, O oh, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defense this head with the shadow of thy wing. And then to close the hymn, Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the match this grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Rejoice in the Lord. So there are three phrases in this text that tell, tell us how a Christian can have a successful life, how you can have a successful Christian life, and how harmony can be maintained in church. Stand fast in your faith in the Lord. Second, agree in the Lord. Make room for each other's faults. And third, rejoice in the Lord. Stand fast, agree, rejoice. Let us pray. Our Father, make these words live in our spirits forever. For your word will never fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not your word. Help us now, Lord. We are frail. We are made of dust, and you know. Give us the power to stand fast in faith, to agree, even when wounded, to agree in the Lord, and to rejoice in the Lord. We ask for these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't see you this Sunday. I hope to see you the next Sunday, which would be October the 22nd. So may the peace of God be with you. Go and make peace in his name.